All right, everyone, thanks for coming out to this lecture on just power. The one goal we're going to take away from this, although there's probably going to be many, is that power is ambiguous. So basically, you're going to read about Hans Morgenthau. In the book, it just talks about him. For him, power had so many different meanings. In fact, his book, Politics Among Nations, is still considered a, a classic and read within the Foreign Service officers, among other areas. But he was basically German, and then he migrated here during the uh, horrific Nazi period. And for him, it's a it's just a broad amount of, of, of variables, industry, geography, technology, innovations, that's research and development. Um, you have national character, morale. What are all these? Well, we're not going to need to know every single solitary one, but the goal to understand here is that power is very ambiguous in national security studies. So take morale. Morale is very important. So during the Vietnam War in the United States, the United States was gung-ho, right, to go to Vietnam, but after a while, that support petered out. The national morale, you know, decreased. Same thing goes with the Iraq war and the war in Afghanistan is that at the beginning, I'm a little older than a lot of you, unfortunately, and everyone was supportive. If you came out against it, it's like, oh my God, you know, that person's a terrible person. They don't support it. Now it's not popular at all. The national morale changes. And this is what they're hoping happens, why we have sanctions on Russia, you know, to kind of kill the national morale after the invasion of, of the Ukraine. Basically, the idea is to make enough uh, Russians feel that it's not in their interest, but also to say, you know, they're suffering for something that they shouldn't have, quote unquote, done. Now, I'm not saying they should or should. That depends on you. But the the invasion of, of Ukraine, the whole goal is, is that killing morale? And if you're a real policymaker and understand national security, it did happen in the Afghan war. I mean, there's evidence that a lot of the women uh, of the old... Um, the veterans of the war when it was going on, the widows, et cetera, were protesting against the Soviet Union in different ways in order to get them out because the national character just was against at that time the invasion of Afghanistan. I'm referring again to the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. So it's very important. And power is, is definitely different depending on where you are. So it's kind of like the weapons of the weak. Um, you know, so if you're a weak power, you might want to create different strategies in national security to sustain yourself and to obviously perpetuate, legitimize your own uh, power. I talked about this before where Mao used to say Chiang Kai-shek was the best arms dealer, meaning he basically um, wanted to get all the military equipment from Chiang Kai-shek. And I said, you know, the Taliban wanted a, 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 a quick... Um, take over so they could take over the military equipment. Um, you know, in uh, Peru, Sendero Luminoso used to do this. Uh, they, they, it's just a common thing. Weapons of the weak, there are passive aggressive attacks in, um, you know, quote unquote terrorism, you know, just slash and burn. Uh, in El Salvador during the Civil War, the FMLN, that was the group, used to go and attack, you know, lights, electricity. They know they're not going to overthrow the government necessarily, although they almost came close. But, you know, to make it more difficult for them to maybe make them come to the bargaining table. That takes us to Iran. Uh, a lot of people have a different understanding of the world, I think, than me in total. But uh, like when the Iranians took the hostages, there's that movie about Ben Affleck and all this stuff. And, you know, it, it makes them <clears throat> not that movie, but, you know, a lot of uh, ideas, particularly at that time. I mean, I wasn't around in 1979, but later they'd be like, oh, those people are a bunch of crazies. They took hostages. It was actually the weapons of the weak. Uh, they didn't know what to do because after they overthrew the Shah in 1979, the Iranians basically said they're going to invade us again. What's our only power? Our only power are these hostages. We're going to keep these hostages and basically say, one, we want the Shah back, who escaped to exile uh, in the United States, and you know we'll give you back your hostages. And two, if you invade us, we're going to kill your hostages. Now, a lot of people might think that's cruel. Uh, this is, you know, an act of terrorism or, you know, against the Geneva Convention. But don't forget the United States and the and, and the UK invaded um, uh, Iran in 1953, overthrew um, uh, Mosaddegh 
and then reinstalled the Shah. You know, the, everyone has a history powers of, of, of invasion. So if you're a weaker power, what do you do? And this was one of their weapons of the week. This is one of their ideas of power. We need to have these hostages or they're going to invade us again. So it's not as irrational as people think. And if you see behind me, uh, if you've taken me, because some students take me, I don't know why, uh, I, I, you know, uh, uh, a million times, and I talk about Nicaragua a lot. This was a picture where I used to work, the Universidad Centro Americana, the UCA, that was the University of Central America, it was a Jesuit university. And this was uh, in the back, in, in, in the area of the, I think it was the library where it's a, um, photos and commemoration of the 1979 revolution. And when they took over power, they didn't know what to do because basically they knew the United States, particularly the incoming Reagan administration, was going to, uh, you know, uh, carry out an illegal war, which they did. I mean, we were taken, that is from the U.S. perspective, the United States was taken to the United States, to the International Court of Justice and lost. And we ignore this completely, but we supported terrorism in the country and other things. So they didn't know what to do. So they basically had to get allies, Cuba, uh, uh, Venezuela, but now with Hugo Chavez, actually under a U.S. supported president, uh, Carlos Enzis Perez was helpful to the Sandinista revolution um, uh, Mexico was a big supporter of the revolution. Uh, obviously the defunct Soviet Union kind of helped with some helicopters and stuff, but not that much. But, you know, this is where the alliance system comes in and our alliance is important in a sense of power. And I say, yes, it can help sustain kind of like it did here, the revolution in Nicaragua for like 10 years. It kind of petered out, obviously, after a while, like revolutions do. But, you know, they were able to overthrow a man named Anastasio Somoza in 1979. And and, you know, they, they surprised the world that they had a revolution in this small country, Nicaragua, and they, they uh, in addition to alliances, did a lot of things to kind of overthrow uh, the brutal Somoza dynasty. One was they used to use women. Uh, they used to use women in order to attract the Somocista National Guard. That's who they were trying to overthrow. They would try to attract, they would use women and then they would say, hey, you know, come to my house, you know, <laughs> stuff. And then when they'd go, they'd ambush the uh, National Guard members and then take their military equipment. So there's a lot of weapons in the week and power is very, very um, intersubjective. It's not just like we were able to defeat Germany, that is from a US perspective and Japan, two developed countries, but then we lost Vietnam. Why? When you look at all the tunnels they had, um, they were very good. And when you look at GIAP, which I mentioned in another lecture, uh, they basically were very good at uh, fighting. And 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 with Vietnamese strategy, as Giap used to say, we didn't take the strategy of other countries. We took the strategy of our own area, our own land. You know, and they knew how to build those tunnels and they surprised everyone from the French to the United States. And then after they kicked out the United States, they were able to go and kick out Pol Pot in Cambodia. So, you know, even though it was a peasant country, you know, they were tough as tax. So the question is, this is another kind of power. So this is something that's very important. And that's why it's very important when you see the um, what's going on in Ukraine. Did Putin prepare with certain alliances, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, uh, India, et cetera? They will not put on sanctions against Russia. Did Russia prepare for these sanctions? And not only that, um, make sure that they're so integrated into the world economy that countries would not be able to carry out sanctions because they knew it would hurt their economies that much. So that's very interesting about power. What is power, right? Uh, protests can be power. I, you know, we see it in Black Lives Matter, um, the Me Too movement. Of course, a lot of people might say, well, that's not international security, but in a way, this is security. I mean, women have to secure themselves that they're safe on campuses. I show the movie, the, it's a documentary, Hunting Ground, where all these, you know, all their big liberal universities, but yet they were covering up sexual harassment. So it wasn't until women got together and said, we are going to, you know, begin a movement, which actually started with, uh, a lot of people don't know, African-American movements, but then, you know, got a big uh, university 
universal response and then uh, trickled into the university system. Uh, and that's where it gets more attention, unfortunately. Uh, but because there's a lot of other people who are sexually harassed and raped, uh, you know, part of the Me Too movement that the documentary didn't cover. But the point is, you know, power comes up through protests. Uh, you know, Black Lives Matter. That's a national security um, issue for them. You know, we, we're in our own neighborhoods and we don't feel safe. The police aren't protecting us. Uh, Hurricane Katrina, you know, uh, when a lot of people don't know, but when they were leaving the uh, a lot of African-Americans from uh, New Orleans, there were these sundown towns where African-Americans aren't allowed to go that were literally blocking them from leaving uh, the area. You know, a lot of people have national security issues that we don't understand, or at least I don't understand. And, you know, it bubbles up. That's why I lived in Nicaragua eight years because I was learning about their own national security interests. That's completely different from ours. So like when you look at it, uh, the United States, this might seem like a tangent. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think I have that COVID thing still going around. I don't know. But uh, but I do hope everyone's safe. Uh, you know, it has been decreasing the numbers, but then some areas are increasing. And that's another thing, you know, in pandemics being a national security uh, issue, which we'll see my um, research, uh, uh, not research, but lecture on uh, COVID in Bogota. So, yeah, I got to drink some vodka. That's also power. Um, but anyways, I'm only kidding. But, you know, the fact that we weren't prepared for the pandemic, that the intelligence was showing us in the United States, is that a problem with, you know, power not being prepared for the levees breaking in Louisiana? I mean, we could go on on hurricane in Houston and stuff like that. So, you know, the goal here is to understand the overarching, you know, you know, power is ambiguous. It's not just about the standard traditional national security. I mean, obviously, that's important. We see the invasion of the Ukraine. So the Ukrainians are saying, wow, we need traditional security because we just got invaded. Right. That's military might, Lockheed Martin giving, you know, weapons, et cetera. But there's also a lot more to national security than that. And, and that's a very important role. Don't get me wrong, but it's much more ambiguous uh, than that. You know, women have their own national security in interests. Indigenous people have their own when we do the religion part. The Mapuche indigenous uh, feel like they're threatened by the state, so they have their own uh, national security issues. The same thing goes with, like, countries in very difficult positions, like the Palestinians, the Israelis. You know, there's a lot of areas of the world where people feel like they're um, just encroached upon enemies. Iran, uh, we're going to see a video. Does Iran, you know, will it be safer with nuclear weapons? And this is one of the things in that uh, uh, video I talk about nuclear weapons. It's not crazy for Iran to want nuclear weapons because as a sense of power, it needs that in order so it won't be invaded. Uh, and it saw what happened to um you know, Libya, Iraq, etc. So it, it might want a nuclear weapon. Same thing with Pakistan after India got nuclear weapons. So it, its sense of power decreased vis-a-vis -a, -vis a neighbor. So it said, you know, in kind of a nuclear arms race, we need that power as well. So power is very ambiguous. It's very interesting. Uh, small groups like this ragtag group of Sandinistas who, well, it, it expanded rapidly, but who overthrew a U.S.-supported uh, dictator, Anastasio Sobosa, in 1979, who's been in power since the 1930s, not him, but the family. So this is a very interesting thing about power. So you have to ask yourself, you know, and when you uh, uh, decide to study national security, there's a lot of different uh, areas to go into this. Um, and, you know, is economic power very important? And it is. Um, and we saw this, if I, I teach in class, this POS 160 class, it's global politics. And why did Russia, you know, fail so miserably in World War One? And um, one of the things that was basically a peasant country. So like industrialization is extremely important for power. But at the same time, right, an industrialized power like the United States that beat G Germany and Japan, of course, with the help of the Soviet Union and other countries, then you ask yourself, how do we lose Vietnam? How do we lose Nicaragua? How do we lose these countries? You know, this is another idea of, of power. So power isn't always fungible. 
that is very important. Uh, that means it's not applicable to other areas. In fact, Henry Kissinger said of Cambodia and Vietnam that, Mr. Kissinger, we're using weapons that are to fight the Soviet Union, not these peasant organizations. So, you know, it is interesting on what exactly is power and protest, national character, all these other things are 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 power legitimacy if you lose legitimacy in the eyes of the people do you lose power right and that's what they want to happen to putin they want him to lose legitimacy and particularly the west and they want him you know to suffer economically in order uh to weaken the resolve of the people to be in the ukraine just like what happened when they invaded um afghanistan so all these things, diplomacy is power, natural resources are power. And I think that's one of the reasons why Russia has been able to kind of, I do this graph of the ruble and it didn't dip like people said, oh, it's going to be a disaster, et cetera. They are uh, really, they really developed their natural gas, oil, as we've all heard. Uh, you know, they withdrew it from Europe. I mean, that's a power, right? Natural resources. If I can withdraw this from someone that's a power. Saudi Arabia said it, right? Biden went to Saudi Arabia to, you know, get them on board because we had very tough relations with Saudi Arabia after the killing of the journalist. And basically the Biden administration was going to be tough on Saudi Arabia. But after the invasion of the Ukraine and the spiking oil prices, Biden changed his tune, right? You know, oh, we kind of need, you know, Saudi Arabia. And so did all these other countries that said they were going to be tougher on Saudi Arabia for human rights abuses. And, you know, then you go back and say, oh, well, sorry. And even Venezuela, they go into Venezuela, like, oh, maybe you're not that bad after all. You know, natural resources are a source of power. Alliances, you know, keeping those alliances strong are a source of power. I mean, when the United States lost Nicaragua in 1979, you know, they felt they felt they lost an important alliance during the Cold War. So alliances. But the thing is, our alliance is good or bad because then they can drag you into war. So, you know, you have to be a student national security. It's a very strong uh, you know, you have to be very astute, like borderline Machiavellian, because, you know, that's what happened to Russia. I mean, it got dragged into World War One, you know, because of uh, the killing of Arch uh, Arch uh, Bishop Ferdinand. And then, you know, these um, alliances got really, really st uh, just stuck and they got dragged in. That's the question about Taiwan. Should the United States continue uh, supporting Taiwan. Nancy Pelosi just went. Uh, that's Taiwan's power. When I lived in Nicaragua, there was a lot of Taiwanese factories. And I said, oh, you're going to continue being independent from China. And they said, well, if you if you continue to support us. So Taiwan's power is basically being in alliance with the United States. So they obviously love Nancy Pelosi, right? Because she went there. Uh, I think that there was a lot of politics involved, obviously, midterm elections. We don't want to look weak, the Democrats, because Joe Biden is not that popular, et cetera, at the time of this lecture. But this is something perennial in politics, right? Taiwan's power is the United States. And they, China obviously knows we're a power, and they kind of want to weaken our alliance with Taiwan, because they know that it's not a country. I've had Chinese students in my class, and they said, well, China, Taiwan's not a country. And, you know, they obviously believe it is part of mainland China. So this is one of the things about power. The alliance with the United States is definitely Taiwan's power. So uh, I'll end there because we could go on for hours about power. But the goal here is to understand power is very ambiguous. It's not always applicable to other areas. Like it was uh, our military might was able to take on Germany, Japan, but then not Vietnam, not Nicaragua, not all these other places we've invaded. So power can be different strategies when we get into counterinsurgency. Um insurgency power, etc. But it, it's a very ambiguous thing in national security. So uh, I want to end there and I want to thank everyone for listening. And I hope if you have any questions, you reach out and uh, talk to me. Take care, everyone.